We need to finish up global prehistoric art today, which means I'm in a hurry and probably don't have a good excuse for this digression. But before I move on to our final required works, I want to note the central role that animals play in prehistoric art and the important role they'll continue to play throughout the course. So why would animals have loomed so hard in early, so large in early art? Well, I hope you've just brainstormed a little. I have a few ideas. Animals would have been both familiar and alarming, necessary to survival and threatening to survival. Our encounters with animals are now pretty tame. You know, pet dogs, zoo polar bears, meat wrapped in plastic, but hunting, herding, and hoping not to become dinner would have been much more central to Paleolithic and Neolithic people's lives. One of your long essay questions on the AP exam is likely to be thematic, and I could imagine a question about the role animals play in art. So let's fast forward and look at some of these uh, roles. Notice that I haven't put titles on these works, and that's because I don't want you flipping frantically through your workbooks. For now, just look and think. This is another trailer. What role do animals play in these two famous sets of sculpture? The Sphinx on the left and the Lamassu on the right, you'll see them both next unit, combine human faces with animal bodies, strong, powerful animal bodies, a lion and a bull. Note that the Sphinx face has a mane and the Lamassu head has horns. Images that combine human and animal characteristics often depict gods. What might the human head part represent? Well, we associate the human head with brains, with thought, with reasoning, the special powers that we associate with Homo sapiens. What about those horns, hooves, fierce claws, long, powerful bodies? These are the animal strengths that these godmen also possess, so stay tuned. All three of these works associate animals with some kind of ritual, often a shamanistic ritual, which involves a person transforming into or channeling an animal to gain access to gods or ancestor spirits, which, by the way, are often the same thing, or to acquire special insights into the natural world, even the ability to change the natural world, for example, to change the weather. Remember that some archaeologists speculate that the camelid sacrum was carved into a mask used in shamanistic rituals, and that the Lascaux cave animals may have represented or induced shamanistic trances. How are animals used in these works? By the way, the two on the left are required works, the one on the right isn't. In these works, animals are used iconographically or as symbols. You've seen the dog from the Arnolfini portrait already. Does anyone know what the ox represents in the page from the Lindisfarne Gospels in the upper left? By the way, it helps to mentally erase the wings. The ox is the traditional symbol for one of the four evangelists, Luke. Matthew, Mark, and John have their own animals, too. The image on the right is from another medieval manuscript, the Book of Kells. Not required, although we'll look at it. So clockwise from the left, you see Matthew represented as a man, Mark as a lion, John as an eagle, and Luke as an ox. The wings make them all look like birds. Uh, to see these images, you have to focus on the bodies and on the heads. These are all decorative arts, but the animal symbols or materials lend these works added significance. Stay tuned. Interestingly, symbolic use of animals returns in a big way for our last unit, global contemporary art. So you read a little about this work. I'm trying to introduce some of these in advance because we'll be rushed at the end of the year. What message is the artist trying to send? What is the meaning of this work? Kiki Smith is, if anything, challenging the image of animals as dangerous predators. She also seems to be suggesting that women can tame the predator in wolves. Maybe the predator in men, too? Why do you think she portrays the woman as naked in this drawing? Maybe the woman is deliberately exposing her vulnerability to the wolf. Maybe she's showing she's not a threat. Or maybe the artist is suggesting that women are especially vulnerable. This particular artist is actually criticized sometimes for portraying women as too vulnerable. Now, I'm about to make a 
very important point, really issue an important warning. So pay attention and note that I'm about to ignore my own warning, but I don't want you to, at least not on your exam. The College Board graders do not want you to express a personal opinion in your essays. That's made very clear in the College Board materials. They will assume that all of these images are excellent works of art suitable for in-depth analysis, or if they don't think so, they'll probably keep their mouths shut. Um, so uh, don't waste words or irritate your graders by explaining why you don't like or do like a work. Although, and I realize this is a subtle distinction, you do want to talk about how an artist uses techniques to elicit a response from an audience. So now I'm going to invite you to break the rule I just uh, gave you, but only in class. What do you think of this work? Do you like it? Well, I'm going to take a turn. I find this drawing a little irritating, mostly because I find it insulting to wolves and maybe to women as well. Wolves, to me, are sleek, elegant, deadly predators. They are not cuddly. And women who choose to cuddle with wolves, to me, they're pretty dumb. I prefer my women smart and maybe when necessary as deadly as the wolves. Give me Judith cradling a severed head any day. I did not know anything about this work. I'd never seen it before until it showed up on the College Board Required Images list. I expected, seeing all those corned beef cans, uh, to learn that the artist was delivering some kind of environmental message. Too many cans in landfills, something like that. For what it's worth, I was entirely wrong. Pisupo, it turns out, is how Samoans refer to canned goods. Uh, this is how the former Chief Justice of Samoa explains it. He wrote, and I quote, When Samoans were first introduced to the wonder of tinned, that's British for canned food, this was in the form of pea soup. As no Samoan word can end in a consonant, they tacked an O at the end and made the Samoan form of the English word pisupo. As time wore on and other edible matter arrived in tins, the generic term pisupo was used for all of it, and now it is more or less confined to tinned meat, like corned beef. I'll continue to quote from a reading you'll probably be assigned in the spring. Quote, it turns out that for decades, pisupo has been a prestige food item eaten and handed out as gifts at feasts, weddings, funerals, and other special occasions in Samoan society. In this artwork, New Zealand artist Michael Tuffery comments on how an imported product has replaced local Pacific Island foods used in feasts and gift giving. Through this work, Tuffery, an artist of Pacific descent, asks questions about the effects colonial economies have had on Pacific peoples and whether foreign intervention actually encourages independence or fosters dependency. Well, who'd have thunk it? So we'll encounter a lot of animals. We will also encounter, in fact, we'll encounter a lot more images of the male and female form. I was actually a little surprised that this work did not show up on the College Board list, since this lady is very famous. This small figure, carved from stone, is about 30,000 years old, which makes her one of the oldest works of art that we possess. She's also tiny. Our new AP government teacher, Dave Hauser, saw her in Vienna this summer, and he shared this photo with me. Ask him about meeting her in person. Here are more works that aren't on the list, but they are famous Venuses. Note the terms subtractive and additive, which are important vocabulary terms that you're going to encounter again next unit. Additive sculptures are built up from a material. So statues made of clay or cast bronze or welded steel are examples of additive sculpture. And in fact, the Venus on the right is the oldest ceramic sculpture ever found so far. Subtractive sculptures are made by whittling down a material, stone or wood. So you should be prepared to identify the sculptures in this unit as additive or subtractive. But what I find really intriguing is how cultures so far apart geographically, presumably without contact, created such similar and maybe somewhat bizarre sculptures. Any thoughts about that? Before I share my own thought, thoughts, let me finally turn to one of this unit's required works. What similarities do you notice between our two Venuses and the lady from Platilco. 
Well, all of these women are well endowed, especially around the hips, although our Mexican figurine wears a smaller bra size. Archaeologists speculate that female figurines such as these had some connection with fertility, human, agricultural, or both. The Venus of Willendorf and the Tlatilco figures are also have what in common? Highly elaborate hairdos. Why? Well, we don't know, though it is quite likely that this implies high status or maybe even association with gods. We do know that crafting these highly complicated dues required meticulous craftsmanship. Remember that you had stone tools only available, and especially because these figures are quite small. In other words, these works were important to the artist and to the cultures for which they were created, worth the time and skill involved in creating them. But of course, what really strikes us about the Tlatilco figure is that she has two faces. Why? Again, we don't know. One doctor theorizes that people born in the region may have seen babies born with an unusual form of birth defect, conjoined twins with a split or shared face. A more common theory holds that the two faces reflect a spiritual system based on duality, the contrast between good and evil earth and the heavens, day and night. Similar figurines have been found not only in tombs, but in open fields. And one theory is that they were sown or ritually buried in the four corners of cornfields, again suggesting a possible connection with fertility. Here are a few more figurines from the same site, Platilco, uh, which is now basically a suburb of, Salt, of Mexico City. Sorry, I started to say Salt Lake City. Uh, including, note, another double-headed figure, although not double-faced. The artists of this culture also produce so-called duality masks. You see one in the left-hand bottom corner. Like the carved camelid sacrum, although these are ceramic, these may have been used as masks in shamanistic rituals. Uh, this shows a contrast between life and death. Uh, certainly the right-hand side appears to be a skeleton with a gaping eye socket. On a more cheerful note, I really love the woman with the dog, which strikes me as having an intimacy that really speaks to us across the centuries. Uh, but you know that I really love dogs, right? We have a replica of this statue, a little older period, uh, on the mantle of our fireplace. So here we see another of this unit's required works. What does the word anthropomorphic mean? Well, it means imitating a human or endowing something with human characteristics, although not necessarily human itself. Uh, so Disney animals are often anthropomorphized in the sense that they talk and act like people. I find the title a little puzzling since it seems pretty certain that these were grave markers. Uh, Stella, by the way, is a tall, narrow stone used as a marker of some sort. We'll encounter that term again. Um, but surely these were meant to convey at least some information about the person buried beneath. And what do they suggest, by the way? It looks to me like the guy on the left is wearing a dagger and a breastplate as well, maybe a warrior. And the person on the right, it seems to me the artist is quite brilliantly with very spare lines uh, demonstrating the sorrow of death. So why do the readings make such a big deal over the display of human, that is anthropomorphic images from Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia is the epicenter of Islam. And as we'll learn in a later unit, the Muslim religion forbids the depiction of any sentient being, any being with uh, self-awareness, human or animal or God in art. But of course, Islam was still four millennia away when these works were created. So how does the artist use line to convey meaning? We've talked about the information that the spare design may convey, but notice too that the stell on the left, the one that's required work, has vertical lines to convey strength, not only a lines in, not, not so much the lines in the drawing as the lines of the stella itself. You have the horizontal line of the belt conveying stability, rootedness, and finally those diagonal lines that add drama. This composition is very spare and the face is highly stylized. Yet both of these in, uh, images, to my mind, capture you know, emotion. The guy on the right, again, communicates the extraordinary sorrow with just a few carved lines. This was a talented artist. 
And since we're talking about the use of line, note the similarly styled geometrical faces on the Lapita fragment as well. By the way, the uh, the statues on the left are subtractive. They're carved into stone. The ceramic is additive, but the faces are actually incised or carved into the clay. So what kind of faces do we find on this extraordinary piece from China? Faces appear to be derived from a combination of a man-like figure and a mysterious beast. Remember that Sphinx and Lamassu that we saw at the beginning of the lecture and the association of combined human-animal forms with the gods? Although the Jade Kong is meticulously crafted, it is still a Neolithic word work. That means it doesn't have a written history. So theories about what its shapes and faces mean are conjecture, but those conjectures are based on similarities to later Chinese works that might have carried the same meaning, but might, might have carried a different meaning. We do know that Kongs were found in large numbers in graves, and graves that we can tell from the goods in them are persons of high rank. So this suggests some connection to ritual might even suggest some connection to power and authority within society. Some of these Kongs show signs of having been intentionally burned, maybe even intentionally broken, and that might suggest that they were used in sacrifice as well. They were often found with bi discs, that may be B, I'm sorry, I should have looked up the pronunciation. The, you see those in the bottom right hand corner. They were also carved of this very hard jade, so hard that it cannot be cut. It can only be abraded or rubbed with sand. Khan Academy, by the way, has a good short video about this process. Actually, I think it's from the Minneapolis Museum of Art. Believe it or not, I did not assign this video, but we'll put it on Moodle in the a little something extra category in case you want to look at it. For now, you should know that jade had great significance to the Chinese and to other cultures where it was found. And when we get to Mesoamerica, we'll see this. Its hardness meant what, would you think, to people? durability. We'll see that the Egyptians also used very hard stone to emphasize the eternal life of their pharaohs. The color variations were subtly beautiful. One of the things I love about Chinese art is that it is often subtle. The square shape of the Kong may symbolize four corners of the earth. And you notice that these faces are on the square themselves. The central cylinder carved into the Kong just like the round B, may symbolize the heavens, again, based on the use of these figures in later Chinese art. We will, in fact, return to these images when we look at other examples of Chinese art just before Christmas break. But for now, I want to move to our last required work for this unit, which is Stonehenge. Vocabulary is a lot easier if you learn a few Greek and Latin roots. Lith means stone. So Paleolithic, the Old Stone Age. Mega, as I'm sure you already know, means huge. So a megalith is, yes, a very big stone. And a men here, again, I may not be pronouncing that right, is a very large standing stone. We'll encounter post and lintel construction again, but Stonehenge offers an especially clear example, so I want to label it. Mortis and tenon construction involves whittling a hole in one stone and a peg in another and using these to join two pieces more securely. The construction method, by the way, also shows up in wooden as well as stone structures. Now, you should note Stonehenge is by no means the only circular stone monument found in Paleolithic Europe. Watch the first minute or so of this video to see several other examples. The video and readings we assigned suggested at least two probably related purposes or functions of Stonehenge. Since this is a Neolithic work, all together now, we don't really know. But what were those two major purposes that are suggested? One was almost certainly to serve as a kind of astronomical observatory. We know that the sunrise of the midsummer solstice is exactly framed by the end of the horseshoe of trilithons, the big stones at the end, at the interior of the monument, and that the sun hits at exactly the opposite point at the center of the bend of the horseshoe in the midwinter solstice sunset. We also know that a number of bodies have been found buried or cremated at Stonehenge, possibly positioned in directions that lined up with Stonehenge's astronomical points. 
Recent scholarship on Stonehenge has focused more on its use as a ritual burial site, and even possibly as a site where human sacrifices were changed. By the way, warning about the College Board, uh, they could ask that because they are interested in your understanding that interpretations of art change over time. As we gather more evidence, as new theories are propounded, I'll try to stay on top of these and inform you, but just be aware of that. The video makes the point that I tried to hammer home when we looked at the caves of Lascaux. Whatever the function, whatever the meaning of the work, Stonehenge was very, very important to the people who made it because what were in fact relatively poor societies, certainly incredibly poor by our standards, invested an enormous quantity of their scarce resources to construct this and other henges. Note too the video's emphasis that Stonehenge was part of an entire complex of ritual sites. Finally, we know that Stonehenge was built over a long period of time and went through at least three construction phases. So it's very likely that the function and meaning of the work actually changed over time. So, I'm going to end this unit with a work that will show up in our final unit and very often shows up in the AP Art History exam. So, let's assume you're a space archaeologist from Alpha Centauri's only inhabitable planet. You've landed on Earth and you come across mysterious remains of this artwork, including this photo. What do you think could be, remember our big four, the function, the content, the context and the form of this work. Any guesses? I'm hoping you'll stop and discuss this. I'm hoping you have time to stop and discuss this. Okay, you come across still another photo. Does this help? Where are we? Well, some of you may recognize Central Park in New York City. The tall building suggests we're in the 20th or 21st centuries, right? Does this photograph change or add to your guess about the content or function of this work? And now that you know the title of the work, The Gates, and you know a little bit more about the context, at least where it was located, can you expand on any of the guesses you've already made? Well, this artwork sparked a great deal of public controversy. Many critics, many New Yorkers loved it. Many others did not. The quotation on this slide comes from a question and answer session with the artists. Due to space constraints, I've just posted their answers. But the fundamental question that they're really answering is the one we began this unit with, or at least the prehistoric art section with. The same question the judge asked in the case involving bird in space. What is art? Is this temporary installation, which cost millions of dollars to erect, and to disassemble, is it art? So how do the artists answer? Try to restate what they're saying in your own words. And now we have another critic's, critic's comments questioning the values of the Gates' as art. Here again, try to restate his complaints in your own words. What do you think? Do the artist and the critic have similar or different visions of the function of art? What does this critic think that art should accomplish? Well, I don't know how much time you have left, if any. I do know that I'd love to be a fly on the wall and hear your discussion. After your first unit test, we will move on to the ancient Near East and back to monumental works made of stone, not orange cloth.